This is CBC Here and Now. Youth march for sober elections in Labrador. It's amazing of what we can accomplish. Now, of course, as tower design is not to blame for deaths. It's the most awesome journey that anyone could ever have. And now she's retiring from a job she's held at St. Clair's Hospital for 50 years. Well, a terrific Tuesday shaping up across the province, but in the long range, I am keeping an eye on Tropical Storm Gert. We'll let you know what it has planned as it sets sail into our region later this week. The details are coming up. We start in Labrador tonight where young people are pushing hard for sober elections. Yeah, youth in Shahajid and their parents rallied today demanding candidates not try to bribe people with booze. The Inu Nation elections take place this Wednesday and as Jacob Barker reports, young people are optimistic their voices are being heard. This walk is led by the youth. They know the legacy of past elections in Labrador's Inu communities and they want change completely different like the election a couple years ago was like you would see drunks instead of sober people yeah. and youth that's all you would see is like alcohol and the drugs but now you don't really see that which is a good thing and that's why people are taking to the streets to like prove that people really do want to change and um i guess expose some truth. It's amazing of what we can accomplish, you know, if just as a sober campaign and for, it's, it's all about the children because they are the future, the future leaders and the future board directors and chiefs. And while there is a change being felt, they do admit the problem still exists. Some candidates, I don't know who, but I know there's some that distributing money or or uh, cat, uh, alcohol, uh, but it went down dramatically than it was the last time. This is the second sober walk here in Sheshashi. There was also one held recently up in Natwashish, and people here are saying that it is having an effect on the way that the campaigning happens. I'm excited. I'm excited for what's happening in the future generations, because it's my, it's my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. I, I give all the credit to the youth, they're the ones, their voice are heard, their voice is stronger uh, than mine could ever be. And at events like this, the youth are given their chance to shine, positive about the effect they've had on this election, and the hope is the same light will continue to shine on future elections as well. The youth are not going to stay silent no more. So uh, it's still going to happen until it stops, until, until people walk the right way. Jacob Barker, CBC News. Sheshashi. And in about 25 minutes, we'll hear more on why some Innu are feeling positive about the upcoming elections. Well, the annual car show in memory of Nicholas Coates was held this past weekend in Conception Bay South. Coates was driving his motorcycle four years ago when he was struck by a drunk driver on Kenmount Road and killed. Over 200 people showed up at the Mothers Against Drunk Driving event. Coates' stepmother is the national president of MAD. She says... Changing people's attitudes and changing the regulations around drinking and driving is a slow process, but change is happening. Right now we have our provincial government is after stepping up to the plate. They have put in roadside sanctions, which will come in effect in September from what I understand. And what's going to happen is if you drive with 0.5 alcohol in your system, then you will lose your vehicle. Um, have vehicle impoundment, lose your license for a certain suspension, and hefty fines. Well, the driver of a car that struck three motorcyclists, killing one of them, has been charged. The accident happened on August 7th on the Northern Peninsula near Wiltondale. A 45-year-old woman from Ontario died at the scene. There's no word on the specific charge the driver is facing. Meanwhile, this scene was captured on a dash cam on Saturday afternoon in St. John's. The RNC say they responded to the incident, but there were no injuries and there was only minor damage to both vehicles. And still with motorcycles, residents around Signal Hill in St. John's say loud bikes are a huge pain. So much so, they've circulated a petition asking City Council to act on the issue. Tonight, there's a meeting at City Hall, and that's where here and now's Ryan Cook is. So, Ryan, what can you tell us about what's happening there tonight? 
Well, tonight at about 7 p.m., Councillor Jonathan Galgay will meet with residents primarily from that Signal Hill neighborhood and hear their concerns. Now, earlier today, we went to the neighborhood and we went door knocking, and that's where we met Sheila Coleman. She's lived in that area for 29 years, and she says the last seven have been especially loud. Here's what she told us. In the morning and night, all hours of night they're going. Uh, I mean, it's affecting your health. I mean, we have people here with babies and the babies are woke up with the sound of the motorcycles. Now, of course, we've also heard the other side of this issue is that it's a safety issue, that the motorcyclists need the loud noise to let the cars know that they're there. We've also heard from motorcyclists who, who just say, hey, I like the noise, I think it sounds good. This is also nothing new. Uh, we, we heard from this in, in 2012 when the city asked the, uh, the provincial government to get involved. In 2015, the RNC asked for, uh, for decibel counters. So it's, it's really nothing new, and uh, Sheila Coleman says that she believes this meeting could just be political fodder, that, you know, Galgay is seeking re-election. Maybe this is, is just, uh, just white noise, she said. So I guess we'll, we'll have to wait and see tonight. Reporting live for Here Now in St. John's, I'm Ryan Cook. An update now on the tragic tower collapse that resulted in the deaths of two linemen near Cumbai Chans in June. It's still not known what caused the steel tower to collapse, but the CEO of Nalcor is ruling out at least one possible factor. Here now is Terry Roberts reports. Jared Moffat of Saskatchewan and Timothy McLean of Ontario were working on a guy wire supported tower like these on June 19th when it somehow toppled, resulting in the deaths of the two men. There's no official word on what caused the tragedy, but Stan Marshall doesn't believe it has anything to do with the towers themselves. And because of that, he's confident that an order prohibiting the installation of new towers on the line from Bay to Spare to the Avalon Peninsula will soon be lifted by occupational health and safety. We have no indication that the uh, cause and accident was related to anything in terms of design and like that, so we think that we'll get clearance later on this month. Marshall would not elaborate when asked if he thought human error was involved. But he did say the tragedy is a sharp reminder to keep a relentless focus on safety. A safety audit of the 230 towers installed on the line has been completed. And if there were design flaws, Marshall says he would have been notified. Marshall says a report on the collapse could also be in his hands by the end of August. It's not known how the delay in erecting towers will affect the schedule and costs of the $300 million project. But clearly, a two-month delay in putting up the 188-kilometer line will threaten the scheduled completion date of late October. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, and changing to a slightly different topic, we want to talk about the National Junior Handling Championships, which were held over the weekend in Bay Roberts. That's right, young dog handlers from all over the country uh, were there to uh, win a chance to represent Canada at Crufts, the largest dog show in the world held in England. Yes, and if you were watching on Friday, you would have seen this young girl and her dog. Uh, this is 17-year-old Jessica Piercy and her Siberian Husky Gabe. They were competitors in the championships over the weekend, and uh, we're told the team did a wonderful job in the finals and fell just short of fourth place. Yeah, another handling competition was held on Sunday. The local juniors and Jessica won first place. Yes. So congratulations to Jessica and Gabe. Well, talk about putting in your time. Up next, we'll hear the story of a St. John's woman who's retiring from St. Clair's Hospital after 50 years. That's coming up after the break. And later on the show, we'll introduce you to two hikers. They're hitchhikers who've just finished their national cross-country journey. We'll be right back.
time to bring in Ryan. But before we get a look at the weather, yep. we're going to have a look at some whales. Of course. Who doesn't <laughs> love whales? <laughs> and who doesn't love wow. seeing orca whales? Oh my goodness. That's yes. So close. This is uh, from the folks at uh, Trinity Eco Tours. Uh, they sent this to us over the weekend, and uh, they say that the orcas are really stealing the show from the humpbacks lately. And you can totally see why. It's amazing. Yeah, the tour company said in its Facebook page that this is the fifth time in 10 days they've seen orcas in the Trinity Bay area. So, uh, right here. yeah, I mean, tourism is uh, where well, the folks flocking to the province right now are really getting a show. And even the locals, I mean, who does not enjoy? seeing sites like this. Yeah. It's, well, it's been a great year for whales because often by this time of the year they've moved on to greener pastures or That's whatever true. the whale equivalent is. That's so. true. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would be afraid or not so with them being <laughs> that close to the boat. They're moving, aren't yeah. they? They're... Don't fall in. Yeah. Beautiful though. Basically become lunch, I think. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, as we transition to the weather, you know, a noticeable stickiness in the air yeah. this morning. I mean, you could feel the muggies. Yeah, the hair. Yeah, uh, yeah. well, it's looking good now, Stokes. A lot of hairspray. <laughs> and the reason is a huge drop in the humidity, a noticeable drop for this afternoon. And that's setting the stage for tomorrow. A nice, comfortable air mass coming in. You can see temperatures right now, 21 to 23 degrees, Cornerbrook to St. John's. That is where we'll be tomorrow. Uh, Labrador, a little cooler, 13 in Labrador City, 17 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Those temperatures actually aren't far off where they'll be tomorrow either. And as we talk about the sticky feeling, all we have to do is look at the dew point. And this morning we were in that 18, 19, 20 range, uncomfortable to oppressive. This evening really dropped off. We're back into the comfortable range for most of us and uh, pleasant really uh, for uh, most of the province. Now the winds have been helping to usher in that fresher air mass. It's certainly been a little on the breezy side. Uh, sustained winds in that 30 to 40 kilometer per hour range. The winds will ease off a little bit through the overnight, but a pretty uh, breezy one again for tomorrow, especially on the coast of Labrador and coastal Newfoundland along that northeast coast. Uh, thanks to that low that is departing. You can see where the cloud cover is most dominant right now off the coast of Labrador. We've been seeing a bit, of the, a bit of that dry punch moving in across the island as things clear out, which has been nice, and that'll set the stage for tonight, which will be a nice one. Winds in from the west, and by the time we get to sunrise tomorrow morning, Hardly a cloud in the sky across the island. Labrador will be the exception. Happy Valley Goose Bay kind of riding the line, but I think you will be clearing but dry, and those showers will be contained generally to Cartwright, McCovic, Hopedale, and Nain. Everywhere else, pretty nice start to the day. We'll drop to four on the plus side in Labrador City, so another cool one uh, for you folks. And as we roll throughout the day tomorrow, again, those showers will kind of remain in the mix along the coast of Labrador. That low is departing, but it's not very fast, and so more shower chances even into the afternoon along the coast. Cloud cover dominant more than uh, is really the dominant forecast uh, for you folks. Uh, showers won't be uh, won't be ongoing, but uh, certainly in the mix. Now, as we take a look at the island, hardly a cloud in the sky even into the afternoon. A really nice one. The other spot we're watching tomorrow, Labrador City, with some increasing clouds and showers rolling in there. If you're looking for a summer forecast in mid-August. Really, this is probably the day that most would order up. We're going to start near 14. We're in a peak near 23. Winds a little on the breezy side. Uh, perhaps that's the only uh, downfall to tomorrow, but still 20 degrees tomorrow evening, so a really dynamite Tuesday. And as you look at the province forecast, really, really nice across the board. Temperatures a little cooler in those onshore winds. Places like Placentia with that west wind blowing right in off the water, it's going to be a bit cooler. Again, Port of Port Peninsula, same deal. Get just inland, you're going to find yourself into some 20 to 22 to even 24 degree temps for central parts of Newfoundland tomorrow. And in Labrador, again, clouds dominant, ch shower chances through the day, cart right up through Nain. Even a slight risk in Mary's Harbor, but I think you folks are far enough south that uh, for the most part it's just a mostly cloudy day. And again, those afternoon showers uh, sneaking into Labrador City. Coming up, we will talk about Tropical Storm Gert. A thing of beauty on the uh, satellite, but we'd like it to stay that way offshore. And we'll talk about what that uh, is, uh, what that has in store for our forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Carolyn, thanks, Ryan. 
Well, she was supposed to be on the job for only six weeks, but now 50 years later, Bernice Morrissey is finally retiring from the ECG department at St. Clair's Hospital in St. John's. Yes, for 50 years, Morrissey has worked at the same job in the same department in the same hospital. And during that time, as an electrocardiogram technician, she's examined thousands of patients and their hearts. Her final day was on Friday and we were there as she said goodbye. <laughs> this is your last day after 50 years. Yes. What kind of feeling do you have in the pit of your stomach? <gasps> Sad. <laughs> it was a job that was so rewarding to me. I never minded coming to work one day. I just just wanted to go there. You know, there was nothing not to want to go to. And I thank everybody for that. A lot of people, when they retire, it's a happy time. Oh, yes. And that's what my husband said. I never saw anybody cry that was retiring. Every night, one else probably cried, but the person re uh, retiring wasn't crying. <laughs> Why are you crying? What are the tears for? Um, I guess for all the lovely years I had and all the lovely people I met and my routine, you know, and I guess I just got to find a new normal now. Can you take me back to when you first came here. Yes. How old were you? What year was it? I turned 19 in May 1967 and I had just finished a business course at Holy Heart of Mary. I walked the streets of St. John's for about a month and a half looking for work and then in July my friend called me that I went to business school at Holy Heartwood and she said that she had been offered a job at St. Clair's Mercy Hospital but she, it was only for six weeks so she wasn't going to take it you know she had a full-time job elsewhere so she said I told sister about you and sister wants to see you for an interview so I went in the next morning and had a very informal interview with sister it lasted about 10 minutes and I had the job so I start the next morning, July 19, 1967. The lady that was doing the ECG, just, she had to leave abruptly. So her and Sister Mary Fabian, who was the administrator, were having that exchange. And Sister Fabian turned to me after the lady left and she said, um, what's your name? And I told her. And she said, and what are you doing? What kind of work are you doing here? I said, I'm typing reports and bringing them to the nursing units. And she said, well, I don't think you're going to be going Friday. She said, I'm going over to the convent now and get someone to train you. And you're going to be our new ECG tech. And that was it. Yeah, and about a year into working, uh, the mother superior of the convent met me one day and she said, Bernice, I was reading in the, you know, I guess the medical journals and she said, there's a course you can do to become a registered technician. And she said, would you like to do that? And I said, oh yes, sister. So she sent for the course. I paid for it and I studied under her supervision for about two years and I became registered in 1970. And here I am 50 years later. Well, in the early days, we were on call 24 hours all the time, you know, overnight. And my mom and dad would get up in the middle of the night with me and, and they were so proud of my job, Carolyn. They just loved it. They were so proud. And I think the fact that they were so proud made me want to do even better, you know. Like I just kind of dedicated my life to being, you know, hard worker and being really good to the patients, really tried to be so kind to the patients. And because of that, I had a lovely life, yeah. And I guess things were so different back oh, then. Yes. In terms of even healthcare, the sisters ran everything. The sisters ran it. And you know, they were a powerful influence on my life. You know, they, they were, uh, they ran, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a tight ship. They, they were strict and they wanted a good day's work from you. But you know, they taught me work ethic that lasted me my whole 50 years. You know, they made sure you knew that the reason you were there was the patient. And that was the most important thing you had to worry about, you know. So I think like that, that had a big influence on my life. Why well, I think I, so loved my job because I felt like 
this job was made for me. I was meant to be in that place at that time. So I had lovely people to work with my whole life. I can just say that it was the most awesome journey that anyone could ever have. Thank you everybody for the memories. Wow. Yeah. 50 years. 50 years. Can you imagine doing the same thing every day for 50 years? And still enjoying it that I'm much at the end. <laughs> yeah, she, she really truly seems to love her job and uh, what a nice lady she was. Oh, it's yeah. great. Well, could you make it across the country on less than 150 bucks? Well, these two students did with money left over. Find out how after the break. Welcome back to Here and Now. Lots of people are doing cross-country trips for Canada 150, but not many are doing it for less than 150 bucks. While well, two students from BC wrapped up their hitchhiking journey at Cape Spear today, they've relied on strangers for rides, meals, and a place to stay. And you might be surprised with how much money they have left over. Take a look. So it begins the hitchhiking part of this journey in White Horse. Here we go. We ended up deciding that we were going to discover our own country one way or another and since we're you know two broke students with no budget we decided we were going to hitchhike and um, it slowly evolved into then 
We wanted to share the story of Canadians with the rest of Canada and make them discover their own country. So that's what ended up happening and now you know we're uh, thinking about making a book and a documentary so that we can more holistically share and just in depth um, yeah, just really share the story of all the Canadians. I mean, that's the reality of this trip. That's the, the goal of this trip is really we set out to meet as many people and get to know as many cultures uh, that exist in Canada. And that's exactly what we did. And the hitchhiking w helped us do that so quickly. So honestly, the generosity and the kindness and the diversity of people that we've met along the way is incredible. And it's just gone far and beyond anything I could have imagined. So. That's been the really strong takeaway for me. I thought, wow, that's really, really cool. So I said to Ron, my husband, I said, when they get to St. John's, we have to host them. So I sent them a message and said, when you get here, give us a call, let us know what we can do to help. And so they did. And I was really excited by it because it's a great way to give back to the youth of our country. And uh, I thought, you know what, if they're taking this on and they want to go across the country and meet people, then we definitely want to help out. I think I'm still kind of in a dream right now. <laughs> <laughs> kind of just walked out of the car and just looked at the ocean and was like, you know, we made it, but I think it's going to take a few weeks for it to really sink in and, and hit me about how, you know, epic this trip was and, and all the different experiences and people we've met. So it's sort of just like I'm kind of floating in this uh, surreal moment right now. That was surprisingly easy. We just got two free poutines without having to do any work. So, it's, yeah. It's like too easy though. I want to give this guy something. So we're going to write a review, share it on the page, hopefully give them some felicity. Um, so in total we've spent $9.99. Uh, so we each have about 145 left, which is pretty amazing. And so it's kind of surreal, but we're actually now considering and deciding which charity we're going to donate our money to. So uh, for Phil, you've decided already. I know I'm gonna give the rest of my money to the Terry Fox Foundation. I was lucky enough to meet uh, Terry's parents when I was still living in Abu Dhabi and I did the run a few times. And so that's, you know, when we passed through the memorial in Thunder Bay, I thought that was really touching. And now we're here where he started. So I think it would be adequate. And I'm coming back, I gotta see this properly, but so far the landscapes, the people, the architecture, it's, it's been really cool. It's a whole different, like, uh, just another of these subcultures in Canada that exist that's really amazing. Yeah, we saw a moose on the side of the road and we also, we were kind of heartbroken when we had to turn right at Deer Lake. We couldn't keep going to Gross Morn because we ran out of time. So we will absolutely have to come back here and that, I think that national park alone validates it and the people of course validate it too. Nice. And they spent five dollars each? Yeah. How did they get on the ferry? Well, yeah, because that's one of the big questions is because you can rely on rides, but, you know, Marine Atlantic is going to want, but they uh, called ahead and they arranged for uh, sponsorship. And I guess they got it just like everything else. They called up and asked. And I think that's one of the things that they sort of found amazing was how many people, if you were willing to just tell them what you were doing, mm -hmm. ask for it, were willing to either give them a ride or buy them a meal in a restaurant or uh, do something like this. So yep. Amazing. Trip across the country, <laughs> five bucks. Incredible. Well, after the break, we'll hear more from Patricia Hines Coates, who lost her stepson four years ago in a drunk driving accident.
Welcome back to Here and Now, and now back to our top story. As we heard earlier in the show, young people in Sheheji marched today demanding that this week's Innu Nation elections be fair and sober. Here's more of what they had to say to Here and Now's Jacob Barker. Oh, it's really different, like yeah. completely different. Like the election a couple years ago was like you would see drunks instead of sober people yeah. and youth. That's all you would see. But now you don't really see that, which is a good thing. Do you think it's events like this that maybe help get the word out or help change things? Yeah, <laughs> events like this, yeah. yeah. Really did help. Yeah. It's awesome. I, I wanted to come here too so my son can be a part of it. I am Inu and he's half Inu, half Inu. And I would like him to look back on being proud of this community and proud to be a part of it. It makes me emotional because I've only lived here a year and a half and I've never felt like such a big part in something and that I can, even if I'm not a part of the community, they make me feel like I'm a part of it, like I've lived here for a long time. And it's amazing of what we can accomplish, you know, if just as a sober campaign and for, it's, it's all about the children because they are the future, the future leaders and the future board directors and chiefs. Three years ago, it was just alcohol being distributed to everybody, buying boats, uh, people were getting alcohol for free, uh, drugs, uh, whatever it was that they wanted, they got it for free. But this election is quite different than it was three years ago. And uh, uh, there's campaigning, family together, going the way it should be. But I know there's still Still, people that are, are some candidates. I don't know who, but I know there's some that distributing money or alcohol. Uh, but it went down dramatically than it was the last time. Well, friends and family came together this past weekend in CVS to remember Nicholas Coates. The 27-year-old was killed by a drunk driver while he was riding his motorcycle in St. John's in 2013. During the annual car show in memory of Coates, his stepmom spoke about upcoming changes to impaired driving legislation. They're also doing a interlock system at uh, a criminal offense. Right now it's point eight. But as you're aware, our federal government is now stepping up and saying that they want the BAC level for the criminal code offense dropped to point zero five. And I truly believe that our Newfoundland government is going to do that. If our federal government is successful and they get in our mandatory screening, I have 100% faith that our provincial government will do exactly the same thing. And that is very rewarding as a mom, as a stepmom. As a dad. As a dad. Because that means there's lives going to be saved. And this is what this is all about. This is about making somebody else realize the consequences of their choices when they drive. And we don't want to see another person injured or killed. Nicholas was um, 27 years old. Um, he was the glue that kept the family together. He really was. He was the person that didn't want to fight. He didn't want to argue. He was just, he loved everyone. He had the strongest character. He was upstanding. He was a brother. He was a fiance. He was an uncle. He was a car enthusiast. He was a civil engineer, but he loved getting his hand dirty. And he loved getting in under the hood of a car. I mean, the things he did to his car and motorcycle was unbelievable. He was beyond talented. And yes, everyone will say, you know, my boy was the greatest. But I truly believe he really was. And anyone you talk to, you won't find a bad word to be said about him. He really was. He was your son. He was my son. He was just <laughs> like his dad. Yeah. And that was something to be proud of. And he loved his siblings. He loved his sister. He loved his stepsister, Amanda. And he loved his stepbrother, Anthony. And, you know, because somebody made a choice, they destroyed everything that we had. Well, moving now to some national news. Ottawa has outlined its top priorities for the upcoming talks to renegotiate the North American Free Trade Agreement. The key issues include better environmental protections, labor standards, and gender equality. But as Katie Simpson reports, the government's vision for NAFTA has sparked concerns from the opposition. 
Trying to remain optimistic, Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister laid out for the first time the country's goals in NAFTA renegotiations. I am confident that this is a story with a happy ending. But, and as I am sure Canadians appreciate, the path to getting there could well include some moments of excitement. Christian Freeland and her team will lobby for a NAFTA modernization to incorporate changes in technology and to cut red tape for businesses. She's also calling for a more progressive deal with rules to improve labour conditions, gender equality, Indigenous rights and environmental protections. But goals around the environment and climate change prompted scepticism from the opposition. Can you speak to how you can ensure or be confident that you can even put the words climate change in NAFTA with a president in the U.S. who basically says that climate change is a Chinese hoax? Freeland later downplayed that concern and fended off assertions from the Conservatives that her government is not prepared for the talks which begin in two days. The first principle is do no harm. I mean, we don't want to come out of these NAFTA negotiations with less than we have now, and that's the big concern that business has. Freeland says her office started preparing for NAFTA renegotiations last summer when it became an issue on the U.S. election campaign. Despite those efforts, it may not be enough to counter the unpredictable Trump administration. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, a new study links hunger that many Indigenous youth endured at residential schools to a number of health problems later in life. Of course, in the springtime when the geese were coming back, that's when probably the loneliest time because you knew, boy, that's healthy food. That's just going over the healthy food that you're not going to have. Researchers say residential schools were underfunded and so students' nutrition suffered. They estimate that many students received far fewer calories than the range needed for healthy development. That puts those who were malnourished at greater risk of obesity and developing type 2 diabetes. The study is published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. Transport Minister Mark Garneau is warning Haitian communities that the U.S., sorry, in the U.S. rather, that Canada doesn't accept everyone who arrives at the border seeking asylum. Garneau says that while Canadian wel Canada welcomes refugees, they must meet certain criteria to be allowed to stay. That you come to the border doesn't mean that you're automatically accepted in Canada. You must satisfy, in the case of refugee status, very specific requirements and principally uh, those that, that say that if you were returned to your country of origin, your life would be at risk. Nearly 1,800 people, most of them originally from Haiti, have crossed the border into Quebec this month. Many were granted special status in the U.S. after the 2010 earthquake, but they now believe the Trump administration will deport them. A temporary camp has been set up near the border crossing at Le Col, Quebec. Two Canadians have been killed in a brazen attack on a restaurant in Burkina Faso. Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland confirmed their deaths earlier today. My heartfelt condolences, the heartfelt condolences of our government go out to the loved ones of those targeted and the victims of this tragic attack. Canadian consular officials are working hard to provide assistance to their loved ones as is our duty. The two Canadians were among 18 people killed when gunmen stormed a restaurant in the capital. Security forces surrounded the building and gunfire continued for hours. The restaurant is popular with foreigners and about half of those killed were foreign nationals. No one has claimed responsibility for the attack. About a year and a half ago, six Canadians from Quebec were among 30 people killed in an attack on a hotel just 200 meters away. Al-Qaeda said it was behind that one. Well, Ryan, you're keeping an eye on Gert, aren't you? I am. <laughs> but before we get to Gert, uh, we w I want to show you this uh, video that just was posted on my oh, Facebook okay. page. Uh, and it's must-see video. This is from Leah Wells. In, this is in New Harbor, Fortune Bay. Now, wait for it here. Uh, they had a bit of company, an eight to 10 foot basking shark. Whoa. Ooh. And yeah. Now, Leah says her little girl called it a big fish. I guess it is a, <laughs> also a big fish. But uh, yeah. Oh Want to get my. your line out of the water if you were doing a bit of cod fishing. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that is in New Harbor, Fortune Bay today. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure we got that on. Da 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 Fortunately, the water's cold enough that not a lot of people are swimming. Swimming, that's right, yeah. 
And uh, fortunately, not a great white shark. That's true, also. Uh, so, thanks to Leah Wells for sharing yeah. that. Now, yes, on Gert. to Gert. And obviously getting a lot of talk. Uh, Environment Canada has added the tro Tropical Cyclone Information Statement to their pages. So a lot of people are seeing that today and wondering what's up. Well, uh, here is a look at Gert. And boy, the GO-16 visible satellite shot gives us a beautiful image uh, this afternoon, especially as the sun starts to set. Again, it's a visible image, so as the sun sets, that's why the wolves, those cloud, cloud tops are getting uh, darker and darker. But you can see the thunderstorms bubbling up around the center of this storm, and you can actually see in the last couple of hours that counterclockwise spin and that eye wall starting to uh, take shape. And uh, yeah, those storms are getting stronger around the center of this storm, and that's why GERT is stronger this afternoon than it was this morning. Now, 110 kilometer per hour sustained winds along this around the center of this storm with some gusts up to 140. It will continue to strengthen tonight. Conditions are favorable. And so likely becoming a category one hurricane before morning and continuing to have that category one strength through the day tomorrow and likely into Wednesday as well. Then it will work northward. It'll come into cooler waters and it's expected that as it crosses the Grand Banks uh, for Wednesday night in through Thursday, it'll transition to post tropical. Still a very strong storm. It'll pack some rain. It'll pack some winds and also bring some big waves to the Grand Banks. But uh, the most notable part of this story is that it's going to be over the Grand Banks, not expected to have uh, much of an impact on land. And I say much of an impact because while GERT will be tracking offshore, some of its moisture may feed into another system that's tracking into our neck of the woods over the next couple of days. And here's how it plays out. So as we roll through tomorrow, this is the low that we're going to be watching moving into the region. It moves into Labrador City tomorrow with some clouds and showers. The island is smooth sailing, bit of cloud cover in fact, a lot of cloud cover and a bit of shower activity still lingering along the coast of Labrador tomorrow as well. Lab City near 15, Happy Valley Goose Bay near 17, and again the island with a bit of cloud over the uh, west coast into the afternoon is looking very, very nice. 20 to 24 degrees. Now, for Tuesday night in through Wednesday, that low will wander closer and we'll start to roll some uh, late day showers up into Happy Valley Goose Bay. Possibility of some late day showers for the south coast of the island as well. I think St. John's and the rest of the island stays dry until uh, Wednesday evening into the overnight. And there is Gert, and this is where we're expecting some of that moisture to feed into this separate system. And so the two uh, will bring a damp looking Thursday. So here's how your Wednesday shapes up again. Those showers, late day risk for Cornerbrook as well. Uh, evening risk for Grand Falls winds are back towards Gander, but I think St. John stays dry until mid, or mid to late evening at, at uh, the latest check anyway. Showers for Labrador City and again, late day for Happy Valley Goose Bay. So Wednesday evening, Again, that added moisture into this system. GERT continues to track offshore, but some of that moisture still continues to feed into our low for Thursday. And this is what would make yeah, kind of a damp period Wednesday through Thursday. And that low will linger into Friday as well. You can see with that northeasterly wind developing a very cool day, especially along the northeast coast. Uh, clouds dominate across the province, temperatures into the mid to high teens. The setup as we roll into the weekend is that late week low departs. Area of high pressure pops in for a visit for Saturday, and then it'll be all about the timing of that next system coming in off to the west Sunday into Monday. Obviously, uh, lots of time to uh, nail that down, but right now Saturday looks good with building clouds on Sunday, and you can see temperatures rebounding nicely after that uh, wraparound cool shot Thursday into Friday. And of course, keeping an eye on Monday, which is solar eclipse day. Uh, not going to be completely visible here. Uh, I shouldn't say, I should say, not going to be a complete solar eclipse here. It'll be a partial eclipse. We hope that it will be completely visible, <laughs> uh, but we'll keep you posted on that over the next seven days. Well, and today we want to introduce you to a young athlete from CBS. Yes, Gracie Organ is five years old and she enjoys figure skating, swimming and playing soccer with the Strawberry Strikers. Great name. Way <laughs> to go, Gracie. You are today's young athlete of the day.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A developer in China is hoping to make history by remaking it. A project is well underway to build a full-sized replica of the Titanic. It's a massive undertaking they're hoping will draw in tourists from around the world. Sasha Petrasik visited the site. The sparks fly and the metal clangs as a new Titanic rises, an icon from another time and place. It's strange, says Chief Engineer Shi Hang. We're building a huge ship, almost like an aircraft carrier here in the countryside, and so famous. The plans call for a near exact replica, a real floating ship in a landlocked basin. It will have a ballroom and swimming pool, first-class cabins where visitors can stay overnight. At more than $200 million today, it's more expensive to build than the original. When the liner was launched in 1912, it was a grand feat of shipbuilding, taking just over two years to complete. Today's Titanic will take longer. Of course, this is a far cry from the real Titanic. For one thing, it's more than a thousand kilometers from the ocean, and it's not going anywhere. And yet, the image it evokes, the legend, is still a powerful one. That movie, Titanic, it really touched me, says Su Shoujun, the man behind the replica project. I want to build this so people remember the sacrifices many made so that others could survive, he says. I hope it's a lesson in responsibility. Of course, he also hopes it's a moneymaker. And that doesn't sit well with some relatives of the ship's passengers who gather annually at the Titanic's port of sailing, Southampton. Jean Legg complained to the BBC. No, my dad lived to be nearly 90, and those sights and sounds stayed with him to the end of his days. I think if he knew this is being replicated, I think he'd be turning in his grave. Originally, there were even plans to simulate Titanic's collision with the iceberg, but that's been scrapped. The promoters figure it's enough to resurrect this spirit from the sea. Sasha Petrasek, CBC News. Dying China. Back in this country, in British Columbia, black bears are ambling out of the woods and into urban areas more and more this summer. Environmental officials say the number of reports have doubled this year. Briar Stewart reports on why this may be happening. Go away! Go away! Cameras were rolling as this unwanted visitor roamed into this garage in a hey, suburb hey. east of Vancouver earlier this summer. It's very big. The bear was focused on the garbage can, hey! but still charged the man filming when he got too close. In the end, the bear got away with the bag of trash. It was a much different ending at another property last week, where conservation officers put down a bear. The bear just opened the door there. Carolyn Key called 911 after her tenant called her to say he was shut inside the bathroom. He was hiding from a bear that was rummaging through his fridge. When I heard it was in the kitchen, I was really scared because I worried about their life. This is an extreme case of a bear encounter, but this summer in B.C. there's been a spike in the number of calls. Since April 1st, there's been nearly 9,000 reports of black bears, almost double that of last year. People will call the Conservation Officer Service to report a bear sighting or a bear that's been uh, accessing attractants. So many of those attractants include garbage, fruit trees, bird feeders. There he goes. That's why people are being urged to keep their garbage in locked containers and not put it outside overnight. Conservation officers aren't certain why bears are being more bold and coming into populated areas. They say it's possible that the forest fires have displaced some, but they believe the weather probably has played the biggest role. So that cold, wet spring kind of transferred into a hot, dry summer, and again, that kept natural food availability quite low through a, a lot of parts of the province. Well, this summer has been particularly busy. It's the fall when bears are the most active. That's when they're trying to eat as much as they can ahead of winter hibernation. So conservation officers could likely get quite a few more calls in the months ahead. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Coquitlam, B.C. 
To the U.S. now, where the president has finally condemned the white supremacists behind a rally that turned deadly in Virginia over the weekend. Racism is evil, and those who cause violence in its name are criminals and thugs, including the KKK, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other hate groups that are repugnant to everything we hold dear as Americans. Trump had earlier said, quote, many sides were to blame for the violence in Charlottesville. In the town today, a judge refused bail for James Alex Fields Jr. He's accused of killing a woman on Saturday by driving his car into a crowd of people demonstrating against the white nationalist rally. Here's a video of an animal invasion on a truly wild scale. Nesting sea turtles took over a beach in Mexico over the weekend, emerging from the sea to lay their eggs on the shore. It's part of their annual migration in August and September, when over 150,000 turtles are expected to lay as many as 15 million eggs. Wow. A lot of turtles. That's a lot of turtles. Welcome back to Here and Now. We've all been stuck in the car waiting for someone to finish shopping. Yeah, and this dog was no different. It had absolutely no time for its owner's dilly-dallying. This commanding canine was honking the horn until its owner came out of the gas station. You can only imagine the arguments on the way home. Oh. I wonder if the dog really knew what it was doing. Yeah. I've got to pee. Hurry up. <laughs> Fantastic video. A uh, quick look at the next three days, and you can see tomorrow is a beautiful day. Uh, the exception, the coast of Labrador and also western Labrador, we're going to be seeing some of those showers, especially for the afternoon. Uh, and then things kind of deteriorate after that. Clouds certainly building in for Wednesday. Wednesday night in through Thursday will be wet across the island, turning cool as well. 15 degrees central to northeast coast with winds becoming northeasterly as that uh, system moves through the region. And again, it'll be uh, grabbing some moisture from Gert. We'll be keeping a close eye on that. Our viewer picture of the day. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, uh -oh, maybe I don't have it. <laughs> 
Oh, no, I don't have it, but it's such a great... Oh, oh no, oh, maybe I do. Maybe I do. Roddy, no. I don't know, maybe it's too late. He's going to bring it up. There it there is. There it is. Oh. Worth the wait. Totally worth the wait. That's Ma fantastic. Madeline Kenny uh, took this picture at Point Rich Lighthouse in port and these guys were just hanging out. They're just chilling out in the monument. <laughs> Some folks uh, have uh, little fires here, so perhaps if... Camping. If their hooves yeah. could light matches, I'm sure they would. <laughs> Some marshmallows on their antlers, maybe. Good night, everyone.